This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, well, a very good evening to all of you here. Um, I'm very pleased to see such a diversity of participants in this evening's seminar. A warm welcome to all of you. Um, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome Professor James Simeon, who's going to be speaking this evening on the topic of supervision of international refugee law. Now, speaking to James beforehand, he said that he purposefully didn't put UNHCR into the title, knowing that that is sometimes a draw for people to come to these sorts of seminars. Having said that, I believe that a great deal of this discussion will be on this question. So if you come with that presumption, you needn't yet feel disappointed. James is somebody who is extremely eminent in the field of international refugee law. He's a professor at the School of Public Policy and Administration in York University, where he's also the deputy director of the Centre for Refugee Studies. James spent a good number of years, over 10 years, within the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada, both as a member and a coordinating member sitting on a number of prominent cases, including that of Pushpanatha, dealing with Article 1 of exclusion. In his judicial capacity, he was for some time the first executive director of the International Association of Refugee Law Judges, an organization with which he is still very much acquainted and involved, and has published widely on the field of international refugee law. I'll highlight simply one of his most um, outstanding pieces, which is the edited volume on critical issues in international refugee law, which I think is probably on the bookshelves of all refugee law academics, and was really one of those books which marks a turning point in the academic literature in heralding a whole series of volumes which have been forthcoming in recent years on international refugee law. James's was one of the first in that series. I know that he also has forthcoming from a similar workshop a book with Cambridge University Press, and I'll take this opportunity to advertise it for him if he doesn't mind, on UNHCR and the supervision of international refugee law, in part the topic on which he's speaking tonight. So without further ado, James, I very much welcome you to the Refugee Law Initiative and um, turn over to your presentation. Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, thanks very much for uh, members of the International Association for Refugee Law Judges for being here as well, and colleagues. And Hugo, thank you very much for uh, the arrangements to have uh, everyone here from the association. And uh, uh, the talk this evening is really coming out of the, uh, as David's indicated, the work that we've done at the Center for Refugee Studies with respect to uh, the whole question of supervision. And um, so my remarks are going to be based in part in my contribution to that uh, edited collection and we certainly hope that um, it will be available fairly soon, although um, I must admit we have a number of people that have contributions that are still outstanding. Uh, this evening what I hope to do is really uh, try to address with you a rather simple and straightforward question, I think with respect to the important issue of the supervision of international refugee law. Uh, I think it's a pertinent question, and you can see it on the slide that I have here, which is, is it reasonable to accept that the UNHCR's capacity to fulfill its supervisory responsibility in the international refugee protection re regime can be strengthened in a decidedly democratic manner to ensure that there is greater states parties' compliance in their obligations under international refugee law. Um, now, the reason I'm raising this particular question is because, um, in essence, as you probably know, the UNHCR has, uh, under the 51 statute, as well as the 1976 uh, protocol, responsibility for supervising uh, those particular treaties and generally, of course, the responsibility to protect refugees. Uh, in essence, uh, 
I'm raising this particular question as well because uh, the argument has been made that there is a requirement in terms of greater compliance on the part of state parties to the 51 Convention 67 Protocol, regional uh, instruments as well for the protection of refugee rights. Uh, the arguments have also been made in terms of greater compliance because if you look at what's been happening in the international refugee protection regime over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, perhaps longer than that as well, uh, but certainly since 9-11, uh, states have actually introduced measures to try to restrict the access to uh, refugee protection uh, within their areas of jurisdiction. The argument has also been made that if there is greater compliance with respect to uh, these international norms with respect to uh, international uh, refugee rights, uh, then in essence it's going to help to further in fact, the uh, international refugee protection regime, but also in, in terms of the mission of the United Nations in general. And I have a particular uh, approach to that, as some of you might know, um, and I'll just take a moment to outline this. Uh, my argument really starts uh, with the end of the Second World War. And at the end of the Second World War, um, something like 65 million fatalities occurred as a result of the Second World War. Uh, you're all aware of why the United Nations was established. Uh, one of the objectives of the United Nations, of course, in its establishment at that time, was to end the scourge of war. And at the end of the First World War, we had the League of Nations, of course, and uh, the total number of fatalities at the end of the First World War, uh, and when you combine that with the Second World War, it exceeded something like 100 million. Uh, and the estimates vary widely, of course. And these fatalities are not necessarily due, of course, to uh, the conflict itself. Many people die because of starvation, disease, and uh, other things. So given the tremendous impact that those two world wars had on humanity. Uh, the United Nations was established, of course, to end uh, these kinds of conflicts. And how was the United Nations going to achieve this particular objective? Uh, in essence, the United Nations sought to do this by establishing an international human rights regime. And if you go back to the 1948 Universal Declaration for Human Rights, that was one of the first instruments that was established. But then, uh, in fact, one of the very first conventions that was established, as some of you may know, was the Convention for uh, the Prevention as well as the Punishment of Genocide. In fact, I think that was passed by the United Nations before the Universal Declaration was passed. Then we had the 1949 Geneva Conventions. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we had the 1951 Convention on, um, of course, uh, related to the status of refugees. And when the 51 Convention was established, it had its geographic and temporal limitations, as you're all familiar, of course. But why was the United Nations so keen on, in this effort to establish a international human rights regime, which is really designed to end, end total war? And as you know, the Second World War was one where we had entire cities that were eliminated. Uh, the only time nuclear weapons were ever used in a conflict. Uh, why was the United Nations so keen on establishing this? Yes, we had millions of refugees in Europe at that time because of the devastation of the Second World War. But also, my argument is that the United Nations decided to actually deal with the human rights of refugees because refugees are, in fact, the most vulnerable persons. And if you are going to establish a human rights regime, if you cannot protect those individuals that are suffering persecution, the most vile and despicable affronts against not only their human dignity and respect as individuals, but also in terms of uh, 
protection of the most basic and fundamental rights, their right to liberty, their right to existence, to life, then how can you actually have a functioning human rights, international human rights system? So my argument is a simple one. The United Nations deliberately selected a number of these key treaties to negotiate initially in an effort to really establish a meaningful international human rights system. And as we all, all know, the 51 Convention, in fact, more than half of its articles deal with fundamental human rights that refugees should be given. And uh, of course, the International Bill of Rights does not come into force until 1966 when the two international covenants are passed by states, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant for Social and Economic Rights. And then uh, with the 1948 Declaration, plus those two seminal international covenants, we have the International Bill of Rights. But preceding this, of course, we have um, the 1951 Convention. The 51 Convention, uh, as you know, being one of the first international human rights instruments does not have a tr treaty monitoring body. In fact, what is unique about this particular convention, as you're probably aware as well, it establishes the uh, UNHCR, which was really a temporary agency when it was first established in 1950 under its statute. And uh, it only had a three-year mandate. And that kept getting extended as the problem of refugees, of course, did not diminish, and it increased over time. Um, and now, of course, it's a permanent organization, the UN agency. Um, so that's my sort of elaborate introduction to the basic point in terms of supervision. Uh, the necessity for maintaining a viable, strong, international refugee protection system is at the very core in terms of what the United Nations is all about. The United Nations is attempting to end world conflict, total war, and the devastation of total war. And if you cannot protect those who are most vulnerable, those individuals who are refugees, then you cannot really um, achieve the broader mission of the United Nations, which is, as I have on the slide here, the maintenance of peace and security within a greater sphere of prosperity, health, liberty, and justice for all. Uh, in the time that I'm going to take this evening, I'd like to try to cover the following. Um, probably not going to be able to cover everything, but um, I will try to cover the legal basis in terms of the UNHCR's supervisory responsibility under international refugee law. We'll look at some of the underlying values that have been suggested that should be embodied in a reform supervisory system for the international refugee protection regime. We'll look very briefly, I'll touch on some of the structural impediments that impact on the UNHCR's operational and supervisory roles. And, uh, if there's time, then I'll go on to talk a little bit about uh, what we tried to do at York University in 2010 in terms of uh, the conference looking at, uh, uh, it has a rather long and elaborate title, but it's really looking at UNHCR's supervisory capacity and what can be done to enhance its supervisory capacity. What came out of that conference was a number of uh, recommendations and suggestions in terms of how accomplish that. But um, some might say, well, it's rather odd that you're looking at this particular role. And uh, is it even reasonable to pose the question that I'm posing this evening to you? Because if you look at the UN's refugee agency, the UNHCR, we all know that it has an operational role in terms of protecting refugees, as well as the supervisory role. And some would say that um, there is a fundamental problem in terms of both having an operational role and a supervisory role. 
And uh, that is one of the major weaknesses in terms of the NHCR. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of an operational role, if you look at the budget of the UNHCR, the budget of the UNHCR, I think <coughs> for fiscal year, and they follow the calendar year, so for fiscal year uh, 2011, it was something in the order of the $3.3 billion. And $3.3 billion, as we know, will hardly address the problem of refugees around the world. And the major problem in terms of the cause of refugees, as we all know, is in fact armed conflict. And some would say, well, that's a huge failure in itself in terms of the United Nations. It was established in 1945 to end war. Uh, they, of course, we're not promising to end war immediately. Uh, and war is a very complex situation, as we all know. It's not something that can simply resolve. But uh, a Canadian actually drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he was a law professor at McGill University in Montreal before he ended up working for the United Nations. And he basically argued that when we pr protect the human rights of everyone, the basic fundamental human rights of everyone, then we're going to take a huge step forward in terms of ending our conflict. Uh, violations of human rights, of course, are one of the causes in terms of conflict. Uh, if we look at the United Nations, the UNHCR, and its $3.3 million budget, of course, uh, that does not meet or come close to meeting the requirements uh, of funding refugees and supporting refugees. And unfortunately, the UNHCR is dependent on voluntary contributions, as we know. It gets very little from the United Nations itself. Most of these contributions are uh, linked or tied to various projects that the donor states, the principal donor states, would like UNHCR to be involved in. Um, so that is obviously an issue in itself. Uh, the other aspect that to keep in mind in terms of this, and, and uh, just to remind you, uh, some would say that it's unreasonable to ask this question in terms of enhancing the capacity of the UNHCR, given its financial and resource limitations. Another uh, limitation or impediment in terms of raising this, and I'm trying to be fair in terms of raising this kind of question, is uh, if you look at the statute of the UNHCR, the statute of the UNHCR says very simply uh, and clearly, the work of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees shall be of an entirely non-political character. It shall be humanitarian and social and shall relate as a rule to groups and categories of refugees. <coughs> so the statute itself mandates the UNHCR in terms of the work that it's required to do for the protection of refugees in a purely non-political way. So um, given the reality that the UNHCR is dependent on its financing from contributions, voluntary contributions, and given the fact that it's expected to do its work in a non-political way, purely humanitarian. Um, given the fact that it has this dual role in terms of operations and supervision, <coughs> is it really fair to say that you could actually think of ways, come up with ideas for enhancing the capacity of the NHCR and its supervisory responsibilities in a decidedly democratic manner? Uh, some would say that's really asking a bit too much in terms of the reality of the situation. Uh, when the UNHCR, uh, in its work in states, signed on to the 1951 convention, there were only six states that were actually parties to the convention uh, when it came into force in 1954. Uh, today there are, I believe, 148 state parties in the convention. And if you look at so it's not a universal document because there are 192 member states in the United Nations. 
So we have about three quarters of the states that are signatories that are party to the Fifth Amendment Convention. So uh, if you look at the development of the convention itself over time, uh, the document in 1954 when it came into force is not the document we have today. Of course, is the 67 Protocol, which is the only change that took place, which uh, eliminated the temporal and geographic limitations of the convention itself. However, the number of state parties has increased dramatically. And there are two fundamental historic events that resulted in the dramatic increase of the number of state parties in the convention. If you look, and I have looked at this, if you look at the decades, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., in terms of the number of states that have actually signed on in goodwill, in good faith, to the convention itself, which obligates those states then to presumably implement fully the convention itself. There are two periods in which the most number of states actually sign on. And some of you are probably aware of this. In the 1960s, what was happening in the 1960s? Decolonization in Africa was happening in the 1960s. And the most number of states that actually signed on to the convention in the 60s were African states, newly liberated. And when was the next in tremendous increase in the number of states that signed on as state parties to the convention? The 1980s and 90s, actually, the 1990s. And what happened in the 90s? The fall of the Soviet Union. With the fall of the Soviet Union and the disintegration of Yugoslavia, we had other states, newly emergent, that signed on to the 51 Convention. So those were the two spikes, if you will, in terms of state that willingly sign on in terms of the convention itself. And, the, and there has been, in fact, one of the efforts on the part of the UNHCR has been to increase the number of state parties. But we're far from having all of the states in the world actually sign on to the 51 convention. And as you're probably aware, there are many states that refuse to do so, India being a principal example. Many of the states in Southeast Asia are not party to the 51 Convention. And there are reasons for that. Some would argue, as B.S. Chimney has argued, it's a Eurocentric document, which is primarily designed to deal with the problem of refugees in Europe. Uh, that is true uh, until 1967. Now, I'm a Canadian, and in Canada, which is known uh, for its human rights record. Uh, we won, um, in fact, the Nansen Medal for our work in terms of uh, contributing to the uh, relief, if you will, and providing sanctuary for the Indo-Chinese boat people uh, after the fall of Vietnam and the problems that occurred as a result of that. Uh, but the history of Canada, I'm not going to bore you with the history of Canada, but some would argue, and I'm not going to deny the fact, of course, that Canada uh, is and has problems in terms of the, the society of the country. We did have racist immigration policies where we denied uh, people of color and various ethnic groups from coming to Canada through our immigration policies. So I'm not going to deny that. And you're all probably familiar with the fact that many uh, boats were turned away with refugees in the Second World War, uh, the St. Louis being a principal example, where uh, a number of refugees fleeing from Nazi Germany were seeking sanctuary, not only in Canada, they also stopped in places in the Caribbean and in the United States and were denied entry there and were denied entry in Canada as well. So I'm not going to be here this evening to pre preach that Canada somehow is this ideal society. However, if you look at the founding of Canada itself, what is very interesting is, what is Canada? Well, Canada emerged as a British colony, as we all know. But the Americans were a British colony as well. And the War of Independence in the United States against Britain, <coughs> Great Britain resulted in Canada to a great extent. And why was that? Well, um, during the American Revolution, 
all those people that remained loyal to the crown were rounded up, put into refugee camps. And they were denied various things, such as their profession. They were denied, of course, the right to be actively involved in the community politically. And many of those people, United Empire loyalists, ended up in Canada, in what was known at that time, Lower Canada and Upper Canada. So we do have a tradition of welcoming refugees, if you will, at our very founding, before 1867, mind you. Uh, another important point, Canada was the very first Commonwealth colony or colony in the British Empire to deny slavery. In fact, one of the, our governor generals, John Graves Simcoe, was an abolitionist and he was responsible for Upper Canada. And he denied the sale of any humans, any persons, on British territory. And this was long before. Uh, the abolition of slavery and the slave trade by the British Parliament. And of course, where did the Underground Railroad end in the United States during its period of slavery? It ended in Canada. And in fact, uh, following the War of 1812 with the Americans, the Attorney General of the province of Upper Canada said, uh, because of the effort on the part of former slaves in support of uh, the British colonies during its fight with the Americans, that they would grant freedom to any person that was escaping bondage from the United States. So, in fact, we do have a tradition, one of the humanitarian traditions in terms of Canada. And again, I'm not going to deny where, where uh, we've had our problems in the past. Um, Canada does not sign the convention until 1969. Why is it? Uh, John Humphreys, a professor at McGill University, who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the principal document, if you will, in terms of establishing all of the other human rights treaties that follow. Uh, why does Canada not sign <coughs> on in 1951 when in 1954 the convention actually comes into, into force. <coughs> well some would argue uh, the reason Canada did not do that was because of the temporal and geographic limitations of the convention itself. Uh, but there were other reasons as well. And uh, sadly some of those reasons had to deal with security concerns uh, that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police had at the time in terms of, of the situation. Uh, but nonetheless, Canada has accepted large numbers of uh, refugees, Hungarian um, refugees, the uh, Czechoslovakian refugees in 56, uh, sorry, 56 was the Hungarians, and subsequently in um, 1968, with the uh, Czech refugees. So we've had waves well before we actually signed on to the convention. And Canada was actually on the executive committee of the UNHCR uh, prior to it becoming a signatory of the 54 convention. Um, let me go on very quickly, just give you the background in terms of the legal basis, in terms of the supervisory role of the UNHCR. David, I knew I was going to do this. Apologies. Okay. Uh, there are a number of documents, of course, that clearly establish that the UNHCR has a principal res responsibility in terms of supervision. Uh, if you look at uh, the United Nations General Assembly resolution uh, that establishes the UNHCR at paragraph two, it clearly indicates this. Um, you look at the statute of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner, paragraph 8, uh, and obviously uh, Article 35, uh, 1 and 2 clearly indicate that UNHCR has a responsibility with respect to supervising. If you look at the 67 protocol relating to the status of refugees, Article 2, 
clearly, again, reinforces the, the role that the UNHCR has. If you look at other international um, law instruments, such as the OAU 1969 Convention, governing specific aspects of the refugee problem in Africa, the 1984 Carnahenna Declaration as well, UNHCR has responsibility for supervising uh, the convention itself. Uh, this whole question in terms of supervision, it, it's a basic one really, um, and the basic one uh, in terms of supervision is presumably you would want all state parties to be applying the convention equally and understanding the meaning of the convention equally as well. So uh, supervision is intended to ensure that all of the states are complying with what they did in goodwill and in good faith, which is sign on to become a state party. And as I indicated previously, not all states have done this. And some states would argue that we protect refugees. We do not need to sign on to the 1951 Convention or 67 Protocol to fulfill our responsibilities in terms of providing for protection of refugees. Others would argue that a certain standard has been established with respect to the Convention itself, uh, and that is something that should be applied. Um, the effect of implementation, then, is a key concern. Uh, and ICFA, the International Council for Voluntary Agencies, has, in fact, identified this as being the predominant concern among its members uh, in the NGO community. That is, the effect of implementation of international refugee law instruments. And presumably, the UNHCR has a responsibility both for leadership in this particular area but also in terms of assisting states when required to um, properly uh, implement the conventions themselves. Uh, one of the cornerstones in terms of the 51 Convention, of course, is Article 33, non mouvement No one can be sent back to persecution. Now, this is a preemptory norm. And presumably, the whole purpose of the international refugee protection regime is intended to do this. Protect everyone's right in this room, everyone in this room. Everyone's right not to be persecuted or to be sent back to persecution. And another preemptory norm, of course, which overlaps in terms of persecution, is, of course, the Convention Against Torture. So no one can be sent back to torture as well. These are preemptory norms, just cogents, in terms of international law. The International Refugee Protection Regime, again, is designed and intended to fulfill that very fundamental purpose, from which all else presumably flows in terms of the protection of rights. Um, I mentioned that one of the complaints that has emerged, of course, is that states are falling behind in terms of fulfilling this basic right, even Article 33, in terms of protecting individuals from this, what all states, if you are signatory to the 51 Convention or not, are required to do, protect people from persecution. Uh, if we're going to change the supervision of the 51 Convention, what are some of the underlying values and principles that should be incorporated in terms of this? And uh, James Hathaway has suggested that UNHCR cannot do two things. It cannot fulfill its operational role, and it cannot fulfill its supervisory role. Effective together. And in fact, to do a proper supervision, a proper monitoring, and when required, enforcement by the requirements of states, that it really has to be an external body, 
So the underlying values in terms of reform to an effective supervisory system, Hathaway would argue, is where you have a genuine program of independent, impartial, transparent, and socially accountable supervision. He would also suggest that it would have to be, whatever this program is, as broadly represented as possible. And this would include refugees. Refugees have certain entitlements once their status is recognized. States have to honor those in terms of very fundamental human rights, such as the access to the judicial system, as an example, or the right to employment, the right for social assistance, for housing, etc. Uh, presumably, they should be incorporated in a supervisory system because their rights are at stake and their voice should be heard in terms of supervising. Um, he also suggested if you look at the development of other conventions that have monitoring bodies and where there's a recourse in terms of complaints, like the Human Rights Committee and uh, the Committee on the, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention Against Torture and so on, what you'll find is those monitoring bodies and what has developed over time is the effective use of pointing out those states that haven't complied to what they've willingly agreed to do in terms of the protection of rights. So uh, naming and shaming in terms of the reporting, monitoring violations, enlisting who has violated those, those uh, rights, and uh, they've found that this is very effective in terms of the progressive development of international human rights law. When states are called out, when they fail to comply, to, again, what they've willingly undertaken, then this should be pointed out to the international community. Of course, the embarrassment is often sufficient to get action over time. So he suggests that should be done. But I would offer to you that uh, in addition to Hathaway, there are many others that have suggested ways that you could actually change the process, the role that the UNHCR has with respect to uh, uh, supervision. Oh, good. Um, so uh, there's no shortage, I would offer, in terms of suggestions for how you could amend the UNHCR supervisory role to make it more effective to ensure greater state compliance. However, you have to be mindful of a number of structural impediments that impact on uh, the UNHCR. And here I'm going to draw on the work of uh, Marjolini uh, Ziek. And uh, she's looked at this issue recently. And she has suggested that if you look at uh, a number of aspects in terms of how the UNHCR fulfills its responsibilities uh, and how states working with UNHCR have uh, fulfilled their responsibility in terms of providing for protection, she suggests that in fact there's been this obfuscation of responsibility, a, a blurring, if you will, of the role of the UNHCR and the role of states in terms of the protection of uh, refugees. And this, of course, creates the confusion, the cloud or the fog around who is responsible for what, and therefore then uh, who is accountable for what with respect to supervision. Um, the financial dependence of the UNHCR with respect to state parties. Uh, can the UNHCR effectively supervise those states that it's actually dependent on financially for its operations? And who are some of the principal donors to the UNHCR? As you're probably aware, it's the United States. I think that comes first. Um, European Union, European community is high on the list. Japan, a number of Scandinavian countries. So uh, among the half dozen or so principal donors that the UNHCR has depended on, can UNHCR actually effectively 
supervise those particular states. Uh, what about the principle of he who pays the piper calls the tune? Can those states that actually are contributing to the uh, capacity of the NHCR to fulfill its responsibilities uh, then expect to be criticized by the NHCR? Uh, Hathaway and others would say no. Uh, that is not possible. Um, Zwick has also pointed out um, other issues as well that have emerged, along with Hathaway. Um, Hathaway makes a fundamental point that I, I'll emphasize, is that the UNHCR has clearly, uh, if you look at international refugee rights instruments, uh, the responsibility for supervision, but it does not have a mon monopoly in terms of supervision. And uh, the UNHCR, of course, like any international institution, wants to maintain its uh, role uh, and responsibilities. And in fact, the UNHCR, as you're probably aware, is no longer simply a agency that deals with refugees. Uh, it's an agency that deals with people of concern. And who are some of the other people of concern? Uh, internally displaced persons, stateless persons, returnees, and the list goes on. In fact, the United Nations has turned to the UNHCR on a number of occasions and expanded their mandate. So the UNHCR has responsibility for much more in terms of the protection if you will, the people, than simply those who are defined as refugees under the 1951 Convention, under Article 1A2. And one of the uh, developing areas in terms of international law and international refugee law is, of course, climate change refugees. They clearly are not defined under the 51 Convention, but they are a growing problem or concern. And of course the courts, as many of the judges know here, have clearly indicated they are not refugees under the 51 Convention. Uh, what is persecution? Are you being persecuted when there is a natural disaster such as an earthquake or a tsunami? Can that be persecution? Well, uh, clearly uh, natural causes, which are non-discriminatory, that are not based on the five grounds, of course, it's very hard to make an argument that that is persecution. And you have a well-founded fear of persecution because of a explosion, a volcanic explosion, or a tsunami, and so forth. Uh, nonetheless, the United Nations has turned to the UNHCR as an emergency response organization that has been very effective in dealing with uh, mass flows of individuals and uh, across borders and boundaries. Uh, so this expanding, if you will, mandate of the UNHCR, which has not incorporated any amendments directly into the convention itself, but it's been through directives and resolutions that have passed by the UNHCR. What does this imply and mean with respect to uh, state parties of the 51 convention? I indicated to you at the very outset it's important to keep in mind that the 51 Convention, when it came into force in 54, was a very different document than the document we have today, in 2012. And why is that the case? We have many more international human rights instruments. That's number one. Uh, we have a different understanding in terms of what persecution is. That's another aspect. We also have a fundamental understanding in terms of who causes persecution. Initially, people thought persecution was, as many of you know, a result of state action. Of course, non-state actors also can be persecutory. Uh, membership in a particular social group. 
can women be members of a particular social group? That became a huge debate that went on for long periods of time. It was resolved in the courts as well. It's been argued that as the international human rights system has expanded, and rights have been clearly defined, they've also been incorporated within the 51 Convention. States have a responsibility then to accept this expansion even if they are not part necessarily of those particular instruments. We also know customary law has changed as well over time. So for the last 60 years, customary international human rights have expanded, the practices of states have expanded. The law has expanded in this particular area. Therefore, the document today is very different than the document in 1954. Not in terms of simply the number of states that are party to it, but our understanding of terms of the document itself. Um, but back to supervision for a moment. Uh, Hathaway points out that the principal responsibility in terms of the protection of refugees lies with states. States also have a responsibility to ensure that each of them are compliant to their responsibilities under the Convention. Because after all, what is the international human rights system? Yes, it's international refugee rights instruments from the 51 Convention 67 Protocol, uh, the so-called Magna Carta, if you will, of international refugee law, but also embodies all of these other instruments, such as the <coughs> OAU Convention, 1984, Carnahena Declaration, and all of the other uh, conventions, customary law, that's now emerged as well. So we can talk about these aspects UNHCR has developed and evolved as a huge organization with close to nearly 8,000 employees around the world in 128 or 134 offices around the world. Uh, the system is in place both structurally, organizationally, and in law. Hathaway argues that what we have in the international refugee protection system is a commitment on the part collectively of an alliance a humanitarian alliance, at least this is my argument, as well as perhaps James Hathaway as well. It's a humanitarian alliance where each of us are willing to support the prohibition against persecution. And if you're recognized as someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution, then you're entitled to certain rights. So we're all working collectively together to ensure that fundamental principle. So that means if one of us is not prepared to pull their share of the weight in terms of doing this, then the rest of us should call that person out. We should be self-regulating, supervising ourselves. Um, is it fair to say that? Well, one of the problems may be that states don't like to really call each other out on these things. Uh, no state, I think, has ever criticized in a direct way anyone else who is a signatory to the 51 Convention of 67 Protocol. So if states are reluctant to call each other out on these matters, and in fact there could be an honest, you could accept, an honest difference in terms of opinion on these matters as well. You can do that, but my interpretation of the Convention is different from yours and we can agree to disagree. Um, diplomacy is important in most states. What state is really going to create a diplomatic incident by saying, you're not pulling your weight in terms of refugees. You're not interpreting and applying the convention appropriately. I think that's uh, a lot to ask of states. In fact, states have created, you could argue, the UNHCR to fulfill that responsibility for them. They were, UNHCR was given a supervisory role because states realized, to some extent, that that wasn't going to happen. Someone has to provide the leadership. 
even in a collective humanitarian alliance, in terms of ensuring the prohibition against persecution. Someone has to have the leadership. Someone has to take the stand, the controversial, the difficult stance of saying, there is a problem here, and it has to be addressed. And these states are not compliant. And so you could argue that, in fact, the UNHCR has a very fundamental leadership role in providing guidance to the international refugee protection regime. Well, um, please keep in mind, there are structural impediments, legally, financially, politically, and diplomatically, to the UNHCR's operations. They're financially dependent, as they've indicated. Uh, the division of responsibilities, the obfuscation of the responsibilities between states and the UNHCR, and it's growing as the mandate of the UNHCR is expanding. Who is responsible for what? Who is accountable for, to whom for, and for what? So if you took, take the paradigm in terms of accountability, I give you the responsibility, I hold you accountable. If you don't fulfill your responsibilities, you shall be held liable for not fulfilling those responsibilities. Breaks down. Because no one's sure who's doing what and who's responsible for what. Um, the point has also been made that states require, or the units here requires the state's ongoing presence in their territories. Much of the operations, of course, uh, the UNHCR is in various states uh, in the global south. Uh, again, UNHCR has, of course, accountability within the UN system itself, uh, within not only XCOM, of course, but also the Economic and Social Development Council, as well as the General Assembly. Uh, and then there is, of course, all of the regional instruments that have emerged. And uh, UNHCR has to deal with that. So these are some of the structural impediments and realities in terms of the operation or the environment of the UNHCR. Uh, again, going back to the point that I made previously, which was, is it fair to even raise this question given the complexities that are involved here? Well, we tried to do that a couple of years ago in a conference at York University called Force Displacement Protection Standards. The supervision of the 51 Convention, 67 Protocol, and other international instruments. And this conference uh, was held with full cooperation of the NHCR. Uh, it was an invitation-only international conference, and uh, many of the distinguished judges that are here this evening were at that particular conference and participated in it. Uh, we had a broad cross-section as well of legal scholars, other academics, INGOs, NGOs, uh, graduate and undergraduate students participating in the conference. Uh, the conference was structured in a particular way as well, which tried to address some of these concerns. We started with keynote speakers, and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Turk was one of the keynote speakers. As a matter of fact, he opened the conference, suggested a number of things that we should be focusing on. The conference was chaired uh, none other than one of the foremost authorities in this particular field, Guy Goodwin Gill. And we had a total of 80 participants. Uh, and this was held over two days. One of the uh, recommendations or suggestions that was made, you might find this interesting. Uh, so in the morning we had the keynote, we had a number of presentations, and then we broke it, broke up into uh, various groups uh, that were led by academics, uh, facilitators, and we came together in plenary sessions to discuss what um, was suggested and examined. Uh, two interesting recommendations came out that I want to bring to your attention. One was uh, the establishment of an advisory committee on the implementation of international instruments. And this advisory committee uh, would be selected by the High Commissioner for uh, Refugees. And it would advise the um, High Commissioner and the UNHCR with respect to state compliance and obligations, uh, fulfillment of obligations. Another was a, a special committee on international protection. 
which would be a subcommittee of the executive committee. And um, that particular committee would have the responsibility for examining regional approaches to refugee production, as well as the issues of burden sharing. Another uh, suggestion that was made, and this was a proposal that, as many of you are aware, has been presented by Justice Toby North on a number of different occasions, and that was the proposal for the establishment of an International Judicial Commission for Refugees. A particular group looked at that proposal and suggested that, uh, uh, that it was probably not something that should be uh, followed up. A number of groups looked at the important role of non-governmental organizations in terms of ensuring that states, uh, as well as the UNHCR, uh, fulfills their obligations. Uh, they also looked at naming and shaming of state parties that do not abide by the treaty obligations and thought that embarrassment was an effective tool for dealing with the shortcomings of various states in this regard. Um, so negative reporting was important. They also suggested uh, that NGOs should take a much more active role in terms of supervision and they would play an independent role in terms of ensuring that states comply with respect to their obligations. So uh, I'm going to draw some conclusions for you. And then we can open the floor for discussion. I'm sure that um, I probably um, raised a number of issues and concerns for you that would like to challenge me. Um, I would argue that we have to strengthen the international refugee protection regime uh, and also its governance structures and we should do this in a democratic fashion and uh, what does that mean we should broaden obviously the participation of people in the presidents um, democracy means rule by the people that means presumably when i talk about democratizing the international refugee protection regime, I'm talking about greater participation of people in the process, uh, and including those people that are most affected by it at any point in time. Uh, any one of us could be a refugee. So all of us have an interest in terms of maintaining the international refugee protection system. Uh, and if you accept my argument that the international refugee protection regime is the critical component in terms of the modern international human rights system, then protecting this particular element of it is vital in ensuring that we do have a viable, effective international human rights system, which is, of course, developed and designed by the United Nations to fulfill its very purpose and mission. Um, looking at the various structural impediments in terms of the UNHCR supervisory role, um, yes, I'm not going to deny there are structural impediments for the UNHCR in terms of fulfillment of this role, but I don't think they should be an excuse for not doing anything. It may be an explanation for why, over the last 60 years, we have not moved to effectively changing the way the international refugee protection system is supervised. But that should not be an argument, I think, in terms of attempting reforms. The Advisor Committee on the Implementation of International Instruments, the Special Committee of the Executive Committee, focusing on international protection, I think, could actually play a very useful role in enhancing the capacity of the ACR to fulfill its supervisory responsibility. I would also argue I don't think this is very expensive, too expensive. I don't think this is a radical suggestion in terms of restructuring the international refugee protection regime. And radical suggestions have been made in the past in terms of scrapping the system, 
renegotiating the 51 Convention, expanding the definition. The OAU Convention, the 84 Cartagena Declaration, has a broader definition in terms of who is a refugee than other international instruments. I'm not talking about new conventions. I'm not talking about radically restructuring the international refugee protection regime. I'm talking about creating an advisory committee for the High Commission, establishing a special committee for the Executive Committee. This is not, I think, dramatic changes to the way the system operates. I think it's a progressive change. I think it's a straightforward, intuitively, I would argue, persuasive way that you can move forward in terms of enhancing the capacity. Um, given all of the constraints that are involved in terms of the way the system operates now. And finally, I think I would take the position that what we require is a robust NGO sector. I think this is absolutely critical to ensuring and enhancing the supervisory system of the International Refugee Protection Regime. And the system should be ground up, not top down. In other words, independent civil society organizations should be taking the lead in terms of pointing out when states have not fulfilled their responsibilities. There are structures in place now, ICFA, for example, <clears throat> at the international level. And in Canada, we have umbrella organizations such as the Canadian Council for Refugees, as some of you are aware. And I'm sure here in the UK, there are similar organizations. These organizations have a very important and vital role. They should be, in fact, playing a greater role in terms of monitoring and reporting on the deficits that occur in terms of state compliance on the lack of fulfillment of obligations on the part of the states in terms of international refugee law. In fact, on assessing the UNHCR itself in terms of its supervisory role. Because the UNHCR has an independent role to play. It has a leadership role to play. And finally, I would suggest there have been no shortage, shortages of good ideas for changing UNHCR's supervisory role for enhancing, if you will, uh, its capacity in terms of dealing with state noncompliance um, and other things as well in terms of the UNHCR with respect to its role in terms of the refugee protection regime. What I'd like to suggest is perhaps there's been a lack of leadership and a lack of political will necessary to bring about these changes. And I'm not simply criticizing the UNHCR or High Commissioners in terms of this in the last 60 years. I think um, all principal stakeholders should bear some of the responsibility in terms of not moving forward on reasonable progressive changes that are necessary to increase the capacity and the supervision of a critically important international humanitarian alliance among states for the prohibition against persecution. And uh, this has been ongoing, this debate, for the last two or three decades. And hopefully now with someone who is at the helm of the uh, Division of International Protection at the UNHCR, who is a noted authority on supervision and supervisory capacity of the UNHCR, Dr. Volker Terra, we may uh, have an opportunity to move forward on some of these changes. And uh, hopefully, people in this room will support those particular initiatives. And I guess, David, I've exhausted what I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, James, for what I think was a, an exhaustive rundown of some of the challenges that UNHCR faced in 
um, complying with its supervisory mandates. I'm sure there are a good number of people who have questions around this issue, but whilst people are formulating those questions, I wonder if I might just pose one or two observations and questions of my own. Um, the first of these is that it seems to me that the question of UNHCR's supervisory responsibility is subsidiary to the question of UNHCR's responsibility for international protection of refugees. So one has to decide what international protection of refugees means before one gets into the question of what supervising that would involve. And I raise this point because although there is a strong argument to suggest that non-reformal is one of the core values of the international refugee regime, if one goes back further in time to look, for example, at the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, then what international protection meant in those times, and I think that a certain sense of this is carried through not only into UNHCR statutes, but also into the Refugee Convention, is that international protection is about offering diplomatic protection where a refugee's own state is not in a position to enforce that. So if you take a rather different view of what international protection might mean, one which isn't about a focus on reform and everything flows from that, but rather looks at the refugee regime as trying to provide some kind of stability in a new land for people who, for certain reasons, can't return home and can't count with the protection of their governments in that land, then UNHCR's supervisory responsibility starts to look somewhat different. It has another element to its role and that is a role as a diplomatic representative of refugees. Now there are some arguments as to the degree to which the League of Nations diplomatic protection function has carried through in current times to UNHCR's role, but it seems to me that that's a question that one would want to address in thinking through what supervision means. One has to think about, first of all, what international protection is. Um, in terms of some of the more sort of practical suggestions, they're, they're very interesting ones. I wondered what, what a supervisory or a special committee for international protection might be composed of. Because in the 1980s, and I think it was discontinued in the 1990s, there was a special committee on international protection within XCOM. Um, and how this proposal would differ from that one. I'm not quite sure why it was discontinued, but you might have said a few words about that. And lastly, some of these recommendations Although to us they may seem like common sense, I suspect to certain parts, certain sectors of UNHCR and the states which give it direction in XCOM, the UN General Assembly, and ECOSOC, these have rather earth shattering implications. So I wondered what UNHCR has said, perhaps informally, to these sorts of suggestions that you've been making in workshops of the kind of people in 2010. Shall I take a few questions? Give you time to think through some questions. I'll try to respond to some of these. They're very challenging. Thank you very much, David. Um, your first question in terms of <clears throat> what does international protection mean and uh, the conception of international protection of the League of Nations as diplomatic protection uh, and the role of the UNHCR as being central in terms of acting as a diplomat or mediating in terms of refugees with states that fail to um, provide protection. They don't, all of this are entitled. Um, the, I guess my counter argument to that would be, yes, I, I agree entirely with your point that it's UNHCR's responsibility should be protection of refugees, first and foremost. So when there is a crisis, uh, and you have mass flows of individuals moving from one area to another area. UNHCR should be responding to that, given its limited resources and capacity, to try to make a contribution to that. And its supervisory role um, may be compromised because it has to move into those territories to fulfill this primary responsibility of protecting individuals, which is their security and life in many instances. And that's obviously vital. Um, however, the approach I think uh, I would take, and I would argue, that uh, with the establishment of the United Nations, uh, following the Second World War, 
and this new approach that has been taken in terms of universal rights and the fact that refugees are entitled to not only protection, but once they're recognized, a particular status which entitles them to rights, in many instances equivalent to nationals within that country. We are talking about something that's fundamentally different. And if you accept my argument that the 51 Convention is principally a human rights instrument that was designed to promote a broader vision in terms of what the world could be under the United Nations, then I think the approach has to be very different from that of simply diplomatic protection. It's really the realization of those rights for the broader purpose, I think, for what the United Nations was intended to do. Um, my understanding in terms of the Special Committee on International Protection is a committee that would concentrate primarily on what has developed in terms of regional rights instruments and the additional responsibility in many instances that states have taken on are higher standards in some instances than actually the 51 Convention with respect to who is a refugee. Um, and trying to address some of those issues and concerns that are special to those particular regions, whether it's Africa, Latin America, or indeed in terms of some of the issues that emerged here in Europe. And obviously, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in terms of that, even in this room. But, um, and, and uh, I do recall that there was a previous International Protection Committee um, within XCOM, and I've quite honestly forgotten why. <laughs> <laughs> They've done away with it, but um, um, I would argue that the other important issue that has emerged, uh, the issue in terms of the tension between Global North and the Global South, specifically, is uh, the, the question of burden sharing and the general reluctance across all states uh, in all continents and regions to restrict, um, uh, if you will, refugee rights and restrict access to those rights. Uh, there is now, if you, know, if you will, a new urgency and a requirement to try to address those concerns. Some of those concerns uh, relate in terms of burden sharing, obviously in terms of developmental issues, capacity issues with various states. But I, I think um, it's generally recognized that there has to be some attention brought to those kinds of regional concerns and burden sharing concerns uh, that must be addressed, that aren't often addressed directly within an uh, With respect to your point in terms of, yes, it might be intuitively right to suggest these sort of minimal incremental changes to the operation in terms of the NHCR that might do some good in terms of capacity building. Uh, and these things may have been tried in the past and have not been successful. And although that might be um, straightforward and common sense in terms of my thinking on it, uh, it may have some broader implications in terms of XCOM and indeed uh, the way the executive committee operates and this broader uh, alliance, humanitarian alliance, in terms of the prohibition against persecution um, but I would argue that these can be worked out. It's a matter of political will. It's a matter of leadership that's shown within the UNHCR, but broader leadership as well in terms of the international community as represented perhaps by these organizations, NGOs, state actors, and others. So my argument would be uh, not suggesting that this is necessarily going to be easy to overcome in terms of leadership or political. But I suggest to you it's progressive, it's minimal, and it might have very um, meaningful and effective uh, impact in terms of capacity enforcement. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open to the floor now. So if you've got a question, can you please raise your hand and I will take two questions at a time. So.
Yes, hello. Thank you very much, James. <coughs> I, I'd like to know if at the, your workshop in 2010, the possibility of something perhaps a little different from the UNHCR was discussed. Apart from Tony North's proposal, which was quite radical, and that's perhaps why it wasn't being taken fully on board. But, I mean, from the presentation, it's quite clear, and we all know the Refugee Convention is a human rights treaty. So why not treat it like one? Why do we have to try to find solutions which are not necessarily those that were adopted by by uh, the human rights conventions. And I've got in mind here I mean, the two obvious ways of supervising human rights treaties, which is one, the reporting system, which you mentioned, and the second, which is um, a court or um, a judicial body. But removed from the UNHCR, not that the UNHCR would be doing a bad job, that's not at all what I'm saying, but you have highlighted so many reasons why they shouldn't be involved. I don't understand then why you, you go back to the UNHCR as being the preferred solution. And what about going back to a, a basic system of an optional protocol or an optional clause or anything optional to just get the ideas in states, minds, that perhaps there is a possibility for a, a judicial body to be carrying out this function of super, uh, supervision of international refugee law. And, and there, just to, just to say one thing which connects to David's point, what do we mean by supervision of international refugee law? Do you have in mind simply the interpretation of Article 1 of the Convention, so the definition, so that we have harmony and you know, equality, as you mentioned, between states? Or are you looking at something much more, much broader, basically? I guess I'm looking at all of it, <laughs> to some extent. Um, but I take your point uh, in terms of uh, emulating what's been effective in the past and uh, enhancing the, the modern, mon monitoring capacity in terms of uh, the operation of state compliance, if you will, the operation of the uh, international refugee protection regime. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I personally oppose the idea of an international judicial commission for refugees, but certainly at the conference, uh, the group that examined that uh, did not think very highly of it for a number of reasons, I think. Um, and if I remember this correctly, some of those included such things as uh, because the advisory body, uh, or sorry, because the International Judicial Commission uh, would issue a judgment uh, that wasn't based in terms of, of uh, any optional protocol or uh, that would be precedential in any way. It would be entirely persuasive. And the argument that uh, Justice Tony North and Joyce Chai have made is that essentially, given the stature, given the research, given the logic, the legal analysis that's put on that, the force of that judgment would then um, somehow permeate judiciary internationally, hopefully through our association and, uh, and others. And then that would have an influence. That would be persuasive in itself. Uh, the arguments that were presented were along the lines that, well, the UNHCR has issued many guidelines. And these guidelines um, have been ignored. Uh, why do we think that a judgment from the International Judicial Commission for Refugees would be picked up? Um, uh, the UNHCR obviously takes a great deal of time to develop its guidelines. It uses a, a broad consultative process in terms of doing that. Uh, these are carefully worked out in terms of leading judgments internationally. So um, they wouldn't be contrary to 
the predominant practice in the states. Despite all of that, the guidelines of the UDNCR are in These elements of soft law are not in The international are ignored by and large. And in, in fact, uh, some people have pointed out, we are not persuaded by the UDNCR guidelines because we are not bound by them. Uh, and our thinking in this area is closer in terms of our own legal culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the argument, the counter argument was that it would not necessarily be followed. Um, it would not be effective in terms of ensuring state compliance with respect to access in terms of refugee rights, for example, or a contribution that states should be making in terms of the protection of refugees as part of this broader alliance. So um, they didn't see this as central in terms of the supervisory role that was necessary. Uh, your point in terms of the important role that courts would make, I'd obviously share that with you. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily broadly accepted amongst the players that were there. Um, and as you know, there's a certain resistance even within the UNHCR with respect to moving forward in various areas because of this dual role that they do have in terms of operations as well as supervision. And um, I think that probably is in the back as well with respect to this. Um, so uh, I, going back to your original point, what do we mean by supervision? I would say, say uh, supervision um, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is conforming to uh, a predominant legal perspective necessarily. It should be uh, the predominant trend, it could be argued, but others have taken the position. How do you create the creativity necessary within the judiciary to move the involved forward and advance it? So the divergency as opposed to uniformity. Um, is something that should be valued as well. And there should, should be an opportunity within this broad alliance again for there to be some variance. And hopefully that variance can be resolved uh, and the law can progress in advance for it. But it shouldn't be a whole group of states going one way and other states going another way. There should be a range in terms of what is acceptable. And perhaps um, in the long term, that is the direction we should be going to a broader international body that would resolve these kinds of differences in terms of international refugee law. But that's a huge project in itself. And what is being proposed here is not a huge project for an alternative optional protocol or in fact a new treaty to establish an international refugee court. It's much more modest than that. Thank you. Yes, you as well. I don't want to sound like uh, Elaine Lambert's junior counsel, but <laughs> I think I share Elaine's concern about, I mean, your, your, your central idea is a democratic deficit. And, I mean, assuming you're right about that, is it going to solve all the problems? Because there's still going to be a judicial deficit, isn't there? I mean, one of the real problems at the moment that UNHCR recognizes is that there, in 70 countries of the world, or 70 odd countries, they're an unsupervised supervisor. They're doing the refugee status determination, and there's no independent appeal to a, to a judicial, judicial body. Unless you deal with that judicial deficit, doing something about the UNA, UN restructuring, going to solve that problem? Um, I, I think I, I would agree with you on that point. Um, I don't think the UNHCR, and, and I'm sure you would agree with me on, on that point, uh, but UNHCR wants to be uh, doing RSD in 70 or 80 countries around the world, either wholly or partially. Uh, it would, I think, willingly give up its responsibility in that particular area. But um, there's a broader issue too, I guess. You could argue that mandate refugee status, the RSD that the UNHCR does under its own statute, somebody should be supervising the jurisprudence coming out of the UNHCR itself. 
Um, the UNHCR, I think, is what? One of the second largest RSD groups in the world in terms of the number of claims that it has to process and its offices around the world under its own responsibility, under its mandate. Uh, who's supervising, who's dealing with the appeals in that process? And as many of you probably know in terms of resettlement, uh, countries are not going to resettle people from refugee camps or other locations unless they've first been determined to be refugees. And that responsibility usually is with UNHCR in terms of its RSD. So uh, I think, um, yes, you're raising a very valid concern in, in terms of the role and responsibility of the UNHCR in terms of doing RSD, whether it's under the delegated authority of the state party to the convention, or under its own mandate and responsibility uh, for statutory refugees or mandate refugees as opposed to convention or territorial refugees. Who is supervising the RSDs or the UNHCR's RSD process? Uh, well, some would argue that is a responsibility that should be taken up seriously by NGOs. And many NGOs are trying to fulfill that responsibility uh, in terms of monitoring the UNHCR's RSD process. Um, there's a common problem in terms of jurisprudence. I don't think that necessarily gets at my suggestion here in terms of these two committees, the advisory committee and the special committee of Exxon, necessarily gets at that particular problem. Um, but if we can look at the International Association for Refugee Law Judges, as a mechanism, as a professional association of independent refugee law decision makers coming together and effectively trying to address these wide divergencies, um, that is consistent with this. And that, I think, underscores an important role that the International Association for Refugee Law Judges is performing in terms of this process. It does not, of course, encompass the UNHCR's RSD process. How does the RSD process of the UNHCR harmonize itself? How does their process of adjudication get incorporated in the broader international refugee law process? Um, I think Justice North and Joyce Chai actually were trying to address this problem as well because their recommendation was UNHCR would introduce a resolution that would be passed by the United Nations. UNHCR would also take the responsibility of actually applying the judgment to its own RSD process. So that would become, if you will, an independent body that could actually impact, presumably, this inconsistency problem that exists within the UNHCR as well as it exists more broadly across states. I'm afraid we've just run out of time. If you've got further questions, you're very welcome to come up afterwards and see if James would be prepared to respond to them. Um, James, I'm very, very grateful for you coming from Canada again, so thank you very, very much.